plug in. Uh oh. Okay, there we go. Oh god. Screen size. Go. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Michael. Thank you all for uh, for coming. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been really, really fun getting to know uh, folks in the in the Iowa and a surrounding area community and um, partying with you guys last night and seeing saw some great sessions too. Um, it's a, an honor to be invited to speak as a keynote speaker. Um, I'm doing a new-ish presentation for me, so apologies in advance if it looks like I'm continuing uh, PowerPoint karaoke, because <laughs> it's, uh, it's new flowcharts. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk about um, the, the sort of the bigger picture vision for me that makes me excited for, um, for the future of Drupal. I got, I got started in, with this project about 10 years ago. Um, a little bit more than 10 years ago, to be honest. I'm, I'm getting old. That's, that's me and individual Drupal Corn sponsor, Neil Drum, in the era of his style in which we, when he called him the open source Jesus, um, <laughs> with the hair. Uh, and, uh, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, why I'm excited for the next 10 years of Drupal um, and kind of where all of this is going for us and, and reasons to be um, positive and optimistic um, for, for many reasons. So. Um, so a bit about me, uh, I, in addition to being around for a long time, um, I've, I've started a few companies. So Chapter 3, which is a Drupal consultancy in San Francisco, um, and they're your Drupal experts. They do great work. Um, we founded that in 2006, me and Zach and Matt, and kind of built that up. Um, in the middle of doing that, we started a bicycle company for some reason um, that has been kind of cool. So we have a, a bike shop in San Francisco that we started in the same office where we made the websites and sold the bikes online and eventually got, up, got going enough to have an office space there. And then, of course, we started Pantheon out of Chapter 3 as well. We kind of fired ourselves to go on and, and try this more, um, uh, in a somewhat more aggressive uh, venture-backed startup kind of thing. Um, and these are sort of all businesses that, that I've built on top of or around or through Drupal. The Mission Bicycle website is, of course, a Drupal website. Um, built hundreds of websites at Chapter 3 and, and now power thousands, tens of thousands of Drupal websites with Pantheon. Um, and through all this, you know, I've, I've learned a few things, um, I think, about, about you know, myself and about life in general. And so, you know, I like being an entrepreneur. I like starting things. I like being my own boss. As I explained to my, uh, my wife and my parents, I probably can't work a, quote, straight job ever again, sort of in ruins. Um, but uh, even more than that, I like being a part of something bigger than me. Um, I think that that's something that we all uh, embrace as human beings, as people. I think that's kind of how we're wired um, as social monkeys. Um, and there's a, a psychological concept uh, called the uh, hierarchy of human needs, which I'll briefly introduce if you're not already familiar with this. So this guy Maslow, who's a psychologist, came up with this about 70 years ago. Um, and the idea is you have certain orders of needs that need to be met as a, as, a, as a person, as a human being. So you have your physiological needs at the base of your pyramid, and that's like food, water, the ability to breathe. If you don't have these things, you're not worried about anything else in life because your survival is in doubt. Literally, you're biologically being threatened with extinction. Um, so assuming that you can breathe and you have water and so forth, now you're concerned with your safety, which is kind of like the, the more medium term guarantee of the same things as well as the notion that you're not going to be attacked um, or beaten up or have your stuff stolen. Um, because if you're in a situation where you don't feel safe, none of these other things that you might be concerned with life are really going to rise to that much importance. You're going to be concerned first and foremost and almost only with your safety. So. Luckily, um, living in Estados Unidos, most of us have our biological needs met and feel relatively safe most of the time. So then we move on to the, the kind of problems that typically bedevil us, which are our social problems, right? You'd like to be a part of a social group. Um, there are individuals who are just totally naturally loners, but they're kind of outliers in the human condition. Most people want to be part of a group. Um, <clears throat> and if you are a part of a group, um, good for you, well done. Um, it's nice if the, you have esteem within the group. You'd like to be, res, be respected and give other people respect. You'd like to have your work recognized and your value validated. Um, now, b bear in mind that the first order uh, problem, or the third order, but below esteem, is the social grouping. So like in high school, you know, I, this happened to me as a, as a young nerdy guy, I sort of would rather be the runt of some other social group 
um, rather than be on my own. So I would take like being at the bottom of the social totem pole over like sitting alone in the lunchroom and eating my food by myself. But eventually you kind of get up there and you work with people and you, you, you grow as a person. And hopefully if you're a, 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 a a lucky enough person to have friends and family that care about you and good good uh, colleagues at your work you have this esteem and you know sort of you've you've got life kind of figured out and you reach the top of this pyramid of human needs which is self actualization and that's the kind of maslow's term for uh, what you get to when you reach the existential question of why am i here why am i alive uh, what does it all mean um, <laughs> And that's a really lucky problem to have. Um, and uh, sometimes it's, it's torturous because you're not sure you know, what you're doing or why. But it's a very luxurious problem to, to have and a good thing to work on. And, and it's really a, a chance to do your best, your, your best as a human being. And, and so Maslow talks about how people find self-actualization through creativity. They find it through, um, through, through helping others, through service, through teaching and learning. They find self-actualization through, through great like, larger social works. And I find self-actualization through my work in the Drupal project. I believe that the internet can benefit humanity. Um, who agrees with me by a show of hands? And that's, that's probably makes sense. That's why we wouldn't be here if we thought the internet was ruining the world. Um, but that's not an uncontroversial statement, depending on who you talk to. Like most people agree that the internet's overall good, but there are many people who fear and kind of loathe what, what the internet is doing these days and the kids and so forth. Um, and I'm gonna talk more specifically about that. So I believe that the internet can bring about a renaissance effect uh, for all of us. So if you think about the, the renaissance and, and what that was, really you had a period in which it became much easier uh, because of technological evolution and also loosening social structures for people to share information. That's really what drove all of this kind of flourishing that happened. Um, you had a, a breakdown of some existing controls over what was permissible to talk about and permissible to do. And at the same time, you had the development of things like early printing presses that made it possible to write things down, get it reproduced, and then spread that knowledge around generally. And from a scientific standpoint, you could say this kind of started with Copernicus and it went through to Newton. And that's like, those, in that like 200 year span, so much happened that underpins all of modernity. It's kind of crazy. And it really was just basically people being able to go out and look at the world, figuring something out, trying their best to figure something out, you know, it's not getting it right necessarily all the time, but getting close, writing it down, talking with people, sharing the information, and then having other people look at what they figured out and do their own ver version of whatever experiments and calculations. And this happened not just in science, but also in, in arts and, and in philosophy and other things as well. And there was this massive sort of flourishing of, of new ideas and energy that really, uh, you know, again, we wouldn't be here without all of that. And it all comes back to people were able to interconnect, share information, and work together to understand themselves and the world around them more effectively than they ever had before in the history of humans as a species. Um, and again, that was about, like, essentially, without the printing press, that wouldn't have happened. Um, but more importantly than just the printing press, it was kind of the networks that emerged. If, uh, if, you, um, if you study the particulars of how a lot of this happened, it really was. There's a lot of, like, sort of... Uh, crucial but not well-known uh, like minor figures in this who were like the people who collected all the different books and then like ran little salons and distributed leaflets and pamphlets and all these interconnectors that made all of this sharing of knowledge and information happen that really drove uh, the, the whole process and really made this renaissance possible. And so I believe that with the internet, humanity is now capable of doing this type of work on a scale that's never been even imaginable before and that we're very early in the process of feeling the results of, uh, of that and that we are actually in, we, we in the room are working on making this more possible, more better, more quickly able to happen and that that has an enormous potential impact on the world around us. Um, so you see things like Wikipedia, right? This is kind of a trite example, but this is, if you take a step back and stop accepting that, oh yeah, obviously I can just Wikipedia anything and find out what the truth is. That's amazing, right? And that's only possible because of this medium that we've created and the fact that the medium allows tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people to work together to collaborate to get a clearer picture of reality and reach a consensus over what's true and what's not. Um, so this is a really big one, but I was just you know, talking to someone the other day, and there's one right here. Um, this is an amazing example of the same thing. 
Um, this is a, uh, <laughs> Michael turned me on to this. So this is a bugguide.net. It's, it's your, your uh, source for, for etymological data. And it's like, it's super active. Like I just logged on in the middle of the Friday afternoon and it was like, here's something posted one minute ago. Here's something posted three minutes ago. This is a, a website that, that John Van Dyke built. It's an old version of Drupal, but it's still going strong. And basically it's allowing people who are curious about bugs and people who know a lot about bugs to get a clearer picture of what bugs exist and which ones they are, right? And the fact that we are able to, as uh, mediated through a, 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 not just the internet, but a technology like Drupal, able to collaborate across vast distances and you know, bring together disparate expertises and experiences, and then from that distill a more accurate understanding of what is, is incredibly powerful. And there are things like bugguide.net that happen every day all over the place and we're enabling those things, which is just an amazing potential driver for human progress and it's gonna get even cooler as time goes on. Um, and and the, the interesting thing here is that we're building something that's more than a printing press because the printing press was ultimately kind of a broadcast media, um, even though it was in, in, incredibly empowering and, and drove all this innovation. The, Printing is still kind of effectively in the experience of one-way communication technology, right? You, someone is writing and has their stuff printed and someone else is reading. There's a producer and a consumer and those roles are, are fairly disparate, right? The, the distance between the producer and the consumer in life experience and what they do is, is fairly large, um, though it was revolutionary. And, and in our context, we're building something that actually, in the experience of building, doing, and participating in, invites a conversation, invites a back and forth, invites former consumers to become participants. Um, and this is in the core of what Drupal is all about. This is like a super old uh, screenshot from a presentation that my colleague did. I don't know, this was like probably 2005, but it was the idea of Drupal is a mashup machine. Uh, I think the, the video that was behind this showed you the idea of using views and publicly available crime statistics from the city of San Francisco and Google Maps to create a map of where the crime was, right? Which is a, not a super complex example, but you could do it in like 10 minutes. And the idea that Drupal is a, is a tool that doesn't just allow you to stick pages on the internet, right? We've all built websites like that that are kind of like billboards or brochures for the internet. And th that's important, right? It's important to be able to get your message out there. It's important for people to be able to find out about things, you know, at that level. That's incredibly empowering. <clears throat> and I don't want to understate the value of, of that or, or something like just having a blog. But the really amazing potential for the technologies that we're building are the ones that go both ways the ones that allow you to interconnect between, you know, that break down this producer-consumer um, uh, dynamic and create a world of participants. Um, and the really interesting thing is that it's not just people-to-people -people participants, it's people-to-other, it's systems-to-systems -systems participants or machine-to-machine -machine participation. Um, mediating the world of what people do is now increasingly possible. And Drupal's actually gonna be, is, is increasingly very good at doing this, which is incredibly important for the future of where this project goes, not just in terms of the types of things we build with Drupal, but also in terms of the impact that it will have on the world around us. The idea here is that we have the ability to better than ever before come together as a large community. The internet potentially unites the entire world. Crazy, sounds kind of hippy dippy, but it's true, right? We can all get together, communicate with one another, observe the world around us, reach a consensus on what is and what isn't, and then decide what we want to do about it. As an as a entire planetary population, that's now conceivable as an outcome of the work that we do, which is just totally mind-blowingly incredible. I did a, a, a variation of this um, talk at a Drupal camp in New York, which was actually in the United Nations, and I, I said at the time, like, imagine what it required before the internet to actually get diplomatic coordination at the highest levels. You're not even talking about people really coordinating, you're talking about functionaries of governments being able to just, like, talk to each other. You had to like build a 40 story building and then like fly people from around the world and like politic and coordinate it just to get people in the same room to have a conversation. And these people aren't even necessarily the right people in, in some cases and they're, they're sort of again a very, very thin subset of the people who should be having a conversation about what's going on. 
that's where we were. Just, just 50 years ago, you had to engage in these massive projects to have an international conversation. And now it's as easy as like, oh, let me pick up my phone and text message my friend in, in Holland. And we can do that back and forth. Um, the potential for that is, is truly amazing and wonderful. And we're a part of creating that. Um, there's a phrase, um, Marshall McLuhan's, the medium is the message. Um, this is a, a communications theorist guy. And this is a really important um, concept, which is, you know, you have the content of a, of a conversation or a con some kind of content, and like that's, that's important, right? The content of the book you read is the, is the information you get. The content of the talk that I'm giving is what you're hearing right now. But there's something inherent in the medium that you're experiencing that implies a message. So like right now, the fact that I'm standing up and my voice is amplified and like the pictures that I want to show you are on a big screen implies a message that like I know what I'm talking about and I'm important and you should listen. Um, debatable, but, uh, but that, that is there. That's embedded in the, in the context of what we're doing. And there is, a, there is a message in the medium of Drupal, which is that we can all do things together, and we can build together, and we can interact together, and that creates really amazing potential and really wonderful uh, outcomes, hopefully. So I want to be clear about kind of what I'm talking about. So that was like a bunch of like idealistic stuff. Um, uh, at Bad Camp, um, in like two years ago, three years ago at Bad Camp, um, sort of uh, uh, Jeff Robbins from Lullabot gave a, a, a sort of a, 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 a far-reaching kind of like think outside the box speech where he talked about how we don't know what devices our websites will be viewed on. And, um, and, and, and it's true, right? There, it's, 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 things are progressing very rapidly, like more and more, like the mobile use of the web is set to eclipse the sort of desktop, laptop use of the web in any, any year now, probably next year, if not the year after. Um, and, and that's a big change, right? That's something that we all experience in our daily lives in terms of what we're building, our, our goals and so forth. You have to take that into account now. And, and in fact, you know, mobile first um, is an idea that, that, that stems from that. Um, and so Jeff was saying, well, who knows? It's phones now, but it could be like, this is a, this is a mood cube. Right, and this is a little device that somebody made that essentially is a, a set of uh, uh, tunable LED lights that you can that has an API, and like the the idea is the mood cube just sits out there, and and like you program the mood cube so that if the stock market's up, it's green, or if it's going to be too hot out, it's like orange or whatever, and maybe like you need to really think about what your website looks like on the mood cube. I don't think we actually have to think about what our websites will look like on the mood cube, um, but I do think we have to think about a world where um, we're making things that are going to be consumed by other systems, where we're, we're going to increasingly build things that are not just rendering pictures for people to look at. We're not just making um, uh, systems that deliver a static chunk of HTML that people, you know, look at through a web browser. Like, if you actually think about that, you know, it's, you know, it's kind of like bypasses your normal thinking, but that's already a systems to systems communication, right? You're producing some code at the end of the day. Your website is rendering out something that if people actually read it, printed it on a piece of paper, would mean nothing, almost nothing to them. And they have a system, a browser of some sort, that parses that code and makes it into something that's visually consumable by another human being. So we're already doing this to some extent, but it's only gonna become more and more and more exciting as the systems that we interact with grow in complexity and in power in terms of what they're able to do. So I don't think the mood cube is really, it should be at the top of your list, but the concept of the mood cube is a pretty good one to keep in mind. Um, I'm mean, I steal, stealing a slide from Dries's, Dries' note in, uh, in Austin, which he uh, gave me permission to do, which is very nice of him. Um, and he, he gave this whole talk about kind of along similar lines, just about how pr technology progresses and we're moving forward to um, a, a new, newer, uh, another model of the web, right? And, uh, and he was uh, looking at this in the context of commerce. And he said, think about this in the future. You know, you're going to have your thing, your glasses, your Google glasses, and you'll be able to, like, see an article of clothing you like. And, like, it'll, it'll talk to a website that already knows who you are and what size you are and where you are. So it can tell you if it's in stock and your size. And it knows, it knows how you like to pay for things. So you can buy it now. And then a drone will, like, fly in with the jacket and you can, like, put it on. Um, <laughs> Which is, sounds pretty awesome to me. Uh, I think that that's a, that'd be an interesting. Uh, I don't know if that's really feasible. That's I mean, have you guys seen the movie Wall-E? 
Uh, so you know like in the, in the part in Wally where they get to like the luxury liner of humans and they're just all like kind of incapable of doing anything because the, the machines like take care of all of their needs and they just get shuttled around and like, po like poke at screens and drink giant uh, uh, like fizzy drinks. This sort of feels like, I, I worry about that a little bit in this context, like where you're just, I want that. <laughs> Um, but if you think about the technology behind being able to do something like that, it's pretty awesome. And, uh, and, and there are a, a number, there's almost an unimaginable number of other applications you could imagine with this sort of uh, set stack of technologies that could do really amazing things. So maybe we'll get jackets via drones, maybe we'll do some other awesome stuff too. I think this is going to change the way that we build cities. This is going to change the way that we interact with our environments um, in ways that are ultimately, I think, much more radical than just how you purchase uh, fashion items. Um, you know, if you think about the challenges that we are going to face as people living on a planet that has its, you know, uh, that has its carbon mix being actively messed with. Um, and, and not intentionally, we're in the middle of a vast unintentional experiment to tinker with our atmospheric balance of, uh, of gases and that's gonna have effects that we are going to have to deal with. The, the best hope that I can think for us to deal with that effectively in a way that, that really doesn't involve a lot of pain and un unfortunate outcomes is for us to get much smarter about how we manage our local environments, much smarter about how we, not just how we emit uh, greenhouse gases, but how we sort of deal with, uh, with, with our, our local energy situation and so forth. And, and a world in which we have lots and lots of sensors and lots and lots of input on how things are going allows us to make smarter decisions if you know, that, that's nice, but it really only works great if we have a lot of different decision-making systems in play. Because once you, you know, a lot of times people think about this stuff and uh, in their mind it's all rolling back to like, there's a master system somewhere. There's like Hal is going to like run all of your stuff. And I don't think that's actually going to work. And his, historically speaking, trying to have a master control system hasn't worked out at scale. Uh, as it happens. Um, you know, we're going to, uh, sorry, I, this is where I, I should have advanced my slide. Lots of sensors going to be around watching everything, but that can be kind of scary, right? The idea that you're always being watched and you're always being observed is, is inherently a little bit frightening. Um, and it can feel very much like you may be losing control of your life or that you may be in some ways being exploited um, by the fact that some things are always watching you or your, your, your information is being harvested or worse, if you have a master control system that's making all the decisions, that could go really kind of, that could become very dark very quickly um, if it decided to make the wrong decisions or decisions we disagreed with or decisions that deprived us of things that we needed. Maybe, maybe not like our physiological needs, but maybe it deprives us of some of our liberties and so forth. Forth. That would be a bummer. Um, sometimes on the internet, even today, without any of this future stuff happening, this is um, a picture of a, a panopticon uh, design for a prison, which was something that they came up with when prisons started to become a big deal um, in the end of the 19th century. And there was the, the, the challenge of, well, we only have so many guards, because guarding people is kind of a specialized, uh, specialized set of uh, um, uh, uh, responsibilities. We don't have that many great guards. We've got way more prisoners than we know what to do with. So they came up with this design where you would put all the prisoners in a, in a round, circular uh, sort of cell system and you had a, little, a single tower in the middle and that was called the panopticon because that could then, one person there could look, turn around and watch everyone. And it's sort of this idea of having a centralized system or a centralized observer that is in a controlling position over all the people around it. Um, just being on the internet today, can, Google kind of feels panopticonal at times. Like it, it's, it's a, I, I've made my peace with it. Like whatever. Like you, I sort of like went all the way to open sourcing my life. But that's not a decision that I think everybody can make. And I, I th think that people rightly feel that they're they're in danger of being exploited or having their privacy violated on a daily basis just because they want to participate in what seems like a really fun system. Um, and I think that. If we're going to have the type of future that we want to have, which is a great future, a renaissance type of future, we have to, in some way, we have to find a way to invert that panopticon to where the only way that I can see this working out is I don't actually believe that we're going to come up with strong enough privacy laws that prevent Google from, from doing what it does or that we're going to get, like Facebook's going to stop harvesting and selling your psychographic data to advertisers or running experiments on you. I, I don't think it's reasonable to expect that that won't happen. What I think we can have is a future where 
there's enough different things that are going on on the internet and we have enough different systems that we can all kind of become our own panopticons. That there's a leveling of the playing field that can happen because this, there's a democratizing effect of this technology being in many, many hands. And it stops becoming a, a, a place where there's a big brother or a, or a single central point of control. Like there'll be some people who are a big deal and, and those big companies and those big systems, they'll rise and fall over time. That's natural. But what's important is that there's a diversity and a democracy of different ways in which people interconnect and a democracy of opinions about how things should be done. That's pretty vital for the future to work out well, I think. That's pretty vital for that renaissance effect to happen. And I think that's something that by investing in open source technology that allows people to build these things on their own terms, in their own ways, we all have a part in doing. So while something like bugtracker.net might seem kind of niche and small, and, and it, it, it is a niche, but it's, n it's not small. Like, you know, you need tens of thousands of efforts like that to really democratize the way in which we are processing information and understanding one another to ensure that our future internet where this all happens isn't one that's kind of big brothery and puppet mastery. I think that you know, when we have a world in which we have, everybody has mobile devices and you've got a supercomputer in your pocket, the potential for creating things that really vastly open stuff up is huge. Um, you know, it may be the case that most people use their phones like this and you could say, okay, that's kind of annoying and you know, people are just tweeting about dumb stuff. But the potential power, and you know, whatever, like people do whatever they, they like, people do what they enjoy, and that's not always going to be uh, producing earth-shaking revelations and inventing calculus. You can only do that so many times. But, um, but the fact that everyone has a supercomputer and a, and a video camera in their pocket means that we're now a world of witnesses, right? You guys recognize this photo. Um, show of hands, recognize the photo, right? So if I was in a, uh, well, if I was giving this presentation in China, First of all, I wouldn't be allowed to give this presentation. Second of all, nobody recognizes this photo because there's, uh, there, there, we, this comes from an era before the internet, right? Where, where in order to get this photo published, you had to have a person, they're photojournalists, they had to like be in the right place at the right time, snap it, they had to hide the film, get it developed, printed in, in, with printing presses in publications that were circulated throughout some of the world, but by no means all of the world. And so there are different versions of history um, around the events that this, this, uh, this, this photo depicts, the sort of Tiananmen Square uprising there, which are largely buried. If you, if you are someone who grew up in mainland China, you don't really know about this. Um, and that's because we are, we are still getting to the point where we can all observe the world, interconnect, and agree on what's happening. Basic things like, did this event actually occur, are debated, although I think objectively it's true. Um, so in a world where everyone has a supercomputer, um, a broadcast device, and a video camera and phone in their pocket, we become a world of witnesses. And it becomes much harder for people to pull, basically, bullshit on other people. Right? And that's really important and that's very empowering. And I think that, again, that's something we should all do. So you have other, other initiatives. So like this OpenStreetMap project, the idea that we're going to actually create a open and publicly accessible database of where things are. And then, then, then empowers everybody to, to know how to get from point A to point B. And sure, like, you know, some people could use that and turn it into an app for driving. But other people could use it for city planning. And the, the, the potential applications for collective understanding of reality are, are almost uh, uh, limitless. You can just keep coming up with them. Um, there's something that I saw on Kickstarter that I thought was really cool. It's like, you know, be your own weather station. Right? So it's like for people who are nerds about the weather, you can like kickstart this $100 thing and stick it outside your house and it'll take all the measurements you want and it has a video feed of the sky and it gives you an idea of what the weather's like at your home. But then if you have like thousands and thousands and thousands of these things spread out across the world and everyone's being their own little weather station, you're going to get much, much better data about what's going on with the weather. Right? This is something that we still don't really understand. Right? We don't really know, I mean, we know at a high level how it all works, but we don't really know. Like, you can't predict the weather. The weatherman is, is wrong 50% of the time because we just don't know how it works. We don't have enough data. We don't have enough understanding. But with things like this, we're going to take a step towards that direction, which is important. That's going to be a big deal. It'll help a lot of folks out. Um, and and it, it, this is happening in, in outside of things like Kickstarter in the new world. So the, um, uh, sticking with the, the weather agriculture theme, which I thought was appropriate um, for, uh, for Iowa, the um, Grameen, which is a microfinance organization that works in developing countries, has been doing a project in uh, Uganda and a couple other places in Africa where they basically go out and they find people who are in, in, uh, in communities who are sort of like 
well respected, like this person's like a reliable person in this community and, and they're somebody people go to, they're sort of already an authority, not necessarily like a political authority, but more of a like, you know, socially well liked. And they say, okay, here's a smartphone. Um, what we want, what we're gonna do is we want you to tell us how all your crops are doing and we'll send you some information about how things are going elsewhere and we can kind of like keep in touch and monitor things. And, uh, and, and just this, this has been going on for a few years and it's actually really improved the lot of many of these, these folks because they're able to, um, it, at the uh, sort of meta level uh, countrywide, know what the agricultural conditions are all across the country, which they couldn't before. They were sort of guessing or you drove around and kind of got an idea basically by what you could see outside the car and then the, the Ministry of Agriculture made a call based on that. And you're able to get people information like, uh-oh, it looks like we're seeing drought conditions all across the country. So, you know, be prepared. Maybe start like thinking about irrigating more, saving your water and so forth, which wasn't possible before because there wasn't a network for doing that communication. Laying these things down and getting this stuff out there really meaningfully impacts people's lives. And, and it's not just things that like we, we see here. It's actually happening all over the world um, and in places that are, that are much more uh, on the rise than necessarily we are where we're sort of at a plateau in technology. Um, sensing and looking at things. So uh, satellites, this is gonna go all the way to us putting things in space that look at the earth. Like this already happens, governments do this, but I guarantee you in our lifetimes, we'll have like regular people doing something like a Kickstarter to send satellites into space for whatever it is that they wanna do. Um, and that's gonna open up amazing amounts of potential. So we already have this thing, this is like Global Forest Watch. So you have all this satellite data of the earth and uh, using uh, 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 machines, you can parse all the satellite imagery and you can figure out where forests are disappearing, right? And this is something that's possible now that well, this wasn't even possible 10 years ago, right? The, the, the satellites existed, the images probably existed, they weren't publicly accessible, and you probably didn't have like, uh, quite enough processing power and enough hands to really have some, a, a, a non, an NGO come up with a way to like, parse the data and do stuff. Like if you were the NSA, you were probably already doing this, but like, who, for what purpose, who knows? Um, this has had a real impact on, on illegal logging and deforestation. Simply the, having the fact that people are watching and the stuff is being recorded and tracked has markedly decreased the amount of illegal logging going on in, uh, in the Amazon basin and hopefully also uh, uh, will have a similar impact in Indonesia where they're focusing on promoting this more now. That's a really big deal, right? The fact that we are a world of witnesses, we are a world that can witness itself, is preventing shenanigans. Uh, and we're, we're going to see more and more of that over time as, as we get better at sensing and better at, uh, at, at aggregating data, processing it, understanding it, deciding what's true, and deciding what to do about it. Um, and this is, all the, uh, uh, so, you know, eyes in the sky, we're going to send satellites into space, and then the, this is uh, the idea here, this is a micro sensor. So, so these are like little like dust motes on a sensor, and we're, we're going to develop cheap and e easily available technology that allows you to embed um, you know, sensing systems into all sorts of stuff. So like you're familiar with the concept of the internet of things. Um, this is part of it, right? The idea that your fridge maybe will be able to tell you when the food is going bad or could tell something when the food is going bad. You might have a, you know, a whole series of systems inside your house or your office that are monitoring the environment, keeping track of things that are going on, aggregating that data and then, you know, helping you make smarter decisions. And again, this is something where um, it, it can go very dark if you imagine that all this is being aggregated into a single, single central system and like there's a big brother that knows all these things. Um, I think that the, the light future is one in which we have a, a very democ democratic decentralized system where lots of people know lots of things and we can decide when and how we wanna collaborate and share. Um, and as I said before, Systems to systems communication is a big part of what makes this possible. So machine to machine connections are a big part of what makes this possible. So, um, so the, the forest watch one is satellites, that's a machine, sending data uh, about the photos down to some database, that's a machine, being automatically aggregated and parsed by a, a, a computer that looks at the images and figures out where the forests are going away. That's all machine to machine communication. But that's good, right? It's not like some weird um, uh, uh, cyborg future. Right, uh, it's actually, the machines work for us, right? And that's a good thing. The machines are there to make our lives easier. The machines are there to empower us. The machines are there to make things more efficient and more effective. As long as we control the machines, everything's fine. Um, 
And that's why the open source is so important. That's why doing Drupal uh, in an open source way is so important. That's the only way to guarantee that the people are in charge of the machines. Um, and I don't just mean uh, human beings, I mean the people kind of with a capital P. That's the only way to ensure that this, these are truly democratic systems, is if a non-trivial amount of this stuff is done transparently in the open and is freely available for anybody to pick up and start at any time. Um, that's, that's utterly critical to everything that we do. Um, because, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, this uh, comic before, but I, I'm always surprised like when I talk to my nieces and nephews, and they don't realize that the, when you are the product of Facebook, Facebook isn't a product that like, is for you. It's something that you, you interact with for free. You don't really have any control over it. It provides value. Like I'm not uh, bashing Facebook here, but I think it's important to be aware that Facebook is free because you're providing them value by, by, by interacting with it. And, and that, that's a, certainly a fair trade-off to make, and, and it's a trade-off that I make. I love looking at pictures of my family on Facebook, but it, you should be aware that you're making that trade-off. If it's not a system that you own and control, it's a system, and you're not paying for it, it's most likely a system that's extracting value from you while you use it. Um, and we just need to become aware of this as people and just you know, have it in our minds as it's going on. Um, Drupal, has a key role to play in this, in this future. I think I got my slides out of order on one. Yeah, so where does the rubber meet the road, right? I've been talking kind of abstractly and for about a half hour now and I'm gonna get into some specifics of things that I think are very important. Um, so Drupal, we're at DrupalCon, I think Drupal has a key role to play in this because Drupal is, as I said before, uh, the medium of the message in Drupal is interconnection, empowerment, participation. It's a natural hub in this digital world. Another slide that Dries let me steal. You know, with Drupal 8 especially, this is, all of this stuff is pretty possible in Drupal 7, but Drupal 8 is really built on this idea because in the intervening time since Drupal 7 came out, this vision for the future of the internet has really matured quite a bit. And we've been building, the Drupal community has been building Drupal 8 towards this vision which I think is incredibly important and gonna be very powerful. The idea that your website is a thing that you can own and control. It belongs to you. You are the owner of your website. The data belongs to you, the code belongs to you. It doesn't belong to anyone else. And that website that you own and control is a hub for all these other things that you may or may not own and control. You know, your users, you don't own them. Um, the data you're integrating from some backend service you might own or might have a license to. Um, the devices that you send data out to, you don't own and control. But you, as whatever you're doing, whether you're the, 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 the amateur etymologist or the business owner or the blogger or whoever, you own and control your website. That is your kind of like castle on the internet. And it is the natural point at which you should interchange data between all these different systems and devices. And Drupal, I think, has the best chance of any software that's freely available now to give as many people as possible the keys to their own kingdom, which I think is incredibly important. Um, technologically, how this works out, one of the ways is like this idea of headless Drupal. I saw a, a great talk on this um, uh, uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, for those of you who are interested in, in more on the code side, this is a theme that's emerging around Drupal 8. It's possible to do, to do headless Drupal in Drupal 7 too to integrate um, with external uh, consumers for your Drupal data and, to, and different backend producers of Drupal data. But this is a, a theme to get involved in. And the idea there is, um, at a very high level, headless Drupal says, rather than just imagining that we're producing web pages that are rendered in browsers for people, think of Drupal as a service that can deliver data to any number of different systems. So you could have Drupal as the backend for a mobile app, you could have Drupal just delivering, um, just delivering content that's rendered by a whole other set of JavaScript things in, in a browser in the front end. You could have Drupal powering a mood cube. That would be headless Drupal. You could have Drupal delivering cards to someone's Google Glass little iDevice. You could have Drupal receiving data. Drupal could be receiving data from your Nest, from your, from your smart fridge. You could have Drupal receiving data from, uh, from a, a, a real-time system that, that's updating business statistics or weather or whatever you want. The idea of headless Drupal is really um, a, a, a clever catchphrase around the notion of Drupal as a serve as a system to system communicator that isn't just necessarily directly delivering things to a person via a browser it could be delivering or taking things from many other systems and I'm developing this concept more and more use cases more and more contributed code that makes this more possible is incredibly incredibly important for the future of this project both in terms of what it can do for all of us in our own lives but also for what it can do for the world in the context of the next five to ten years um, whoops I should have maybe put that out there uh, 
So Drupal, as the, this is the sort of the model of the headless web, so like rather than, you know, you can deliver to JavaScript instead of directly to the browser. Um, and then Drupal as this receiver of data as well. So Drupal is this kind of like, you know, your Drupal site on your website, it's your satellite on the internet that you can beam data into from many different sources. So you can have Drupal websites that accept, um, you can have a little like mobile app that you give out to like thousands of people that report on whatever's going on around them. And that could all be feeding into your Drupal website that then produces something that's more of a normal website that's an aggregate of all those things. Um, that's actually not that difficult to do and it becomes increasingly easy with Drupal 8. And those sorts of applications, um, they're a little bit more complex, but I think if we get some good like processes laid down and some good contrib code, we can actually make it so that it's relatively easy for people to build these sorts of things. Just like it was relatively easy back in Drupal 4.7 to take views, Google Maps, and the San Francisco CSV of Prime data and make a mashup map. Um, the future of Drupal as a mashup machine for all the systems that we interact with um, is, is really, it's right in front of us and it's going to be so exciting. We're going to have this amazing network of different things, different sensors, different communities, different topics, and we're going to hopefully be able to wire all these things together in a way that's very, um, very non, not, not, not very hierarchical. There shouldn't be a central point of control. It should be a nodal network. And each one of those nodes are independent of one another. They can choose who they connect with, and they can choose how they work together. Um, these are different nodes that you, you could own and control some of these. Um, and we can develop an organic sort of way of sharing information as a society, um, as a global society, right? Everybody can decide who they want to interconnect with. And I think that given our natural human proclivity to want to be social creatures, that's going to mean that we enter, end up interconnecting with a lot of people in ways that's ultimately beneficial for us because we want to be part of social groups. We want to have esteem. Those are, those are things that are embedded in our lizard brains. Like those are pre-conscious thoughts. That's how we all want it to be. And with the right set of technologies and the right set of processes, I think we can have that. I think we can have that renaissance effect um, if we play our cards right. It's not just up to Drupal to do this, but um, I'm, from my perspective, that's what gets me excited every day, is, is being a part of this through this work. So to sum up, um, I want to close with, uh, to reiterate that we're just getting started. I've been doing Drupal for over 10 years, and so sometimes I wake up and I'm like, ah, oh, God, Drupal again. So over it. Um, and it's important to remember that we're really early in the story of what all this stuff means. Um, technology becomes revolutionary when it fades into the background. When you're, when you're having a conversation and the story is all about the tech, you're sort of, you know you're early because you're still kind of obsessing over what the thing is and not what it does and not how it has ripple effects that change the world around it. Um, we're really early in the story. The whole world is just getting started. It's, it's, it's uh, important to emphasize that and to keep that perspective when you think about open source or the internet, is that we're really early. The whole world is just getting started. Um, this is a graph that I'm going to show. It's some data from the World Bank. It's a time series starting in 1990 and going to, to 2012. So up is internet access and the right is wealth by country. And you can see, go. Starting in, like, you know, we're, it's early, nobody really has the internet. Okay, it's the United States is starting to get the internet. It's like dot com boom era. Okay, now things are taking off and we're still growing. People are getting a little bit richer. There's going to be a recession. Woo! Oh, and then we're going back to growth again. So the, the story of this graph should be fairly clear. The bubbles are grouped, the bubble size indicates population. So, like, most of the world is just getting started. But they're all going up and they're all going to the right. That's clearly the trend. Um, in the next 10 years, thinking about the 10 year future of Drupal, there are like four to five billion more people will be connected to the internet than are today. The types of things that we're able to do with that aggregate brain power of human beings interacting and interconnected is, is, is really almost unimaginable. It's almost impossible to overstate the scope of the opportunity of the, the meta, large, human scale, global project that we're involved in through this work. Um, because technology really does become revolutionary when it fades into the background and it lets people do things that weren't possible before. It's not about the gadget, it's about the application. It's about what you do as a person now that you have the gadget or that the gadget is just an assumed part of your life. Um, and I find this, you know, on my days when I feel like I'm kind of over Drupal or I'm not sure, you know, if I really want to go into work, I sort of think about this a little bit in the morning. 
as I'm drinking my coffee, and then I feel really excited to like get on my bike and head into the office because this is probably the most exciting thing I could imagine working on in, in my entire life, and it's, it's inspiring uh, to be a part of a community that I think whether or not everybody articulates this vision, I'm not saying you have to believe the things that I believe. I think that we are all part of this bigger project, and it's really um, endlessly uh, uh, inspiring and entertaining to work with all of you on something that's this big, this grand, this generous, and this important. Because um, it's really about all of us, and it's going to be amazing. Um, that's my keynote. Thanks. I think I went five minutes over, so if you, if anybody has a question they want to ask now, I'll take it. Otherwise, you can talk to me later. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, session started in ten minutes.